ever since I started this series, quite a few promotions have been suggested, but none more than this one. It was a small, local, outlaw promotion that survived the ever-changing wrestling business for over a decade. Along the way, it became a reliable pit stop for some major names in between stints with the Big Two, and also helped kickstart the careers of many top names of the 1990s. This is Defunct Championship Wrestling Episode 4, IWCCW, International World Class Championship Wrestling. International World Class Championship Wrestling brings you the hottest wrestling action in the 90s. International World Class Championship Wrestling was an outlaw promotion based out of Boston, Mass., and founded by promoters Angelo Savoldi and his sons Mario and Joe as ICW, International Championship Wrestling, back in 1985. Not to be confused with the other outlaw ICW, started by a guy named Angelo and his sons down in Memphis. Outlaw was a name given to promotions in the territory days that operated as opposition to the established and sanctioned NWA promotions in those various territories. Because of the stranglehold of the NWA, many of these promotions died off quickly. And they'll probably all be subjects of this series eventually. You know, like Outlaw Mud Show. That's where it comes from. But Angelo Savoldi picked the right territory at the right time. New England had historically been controlled by the McMahons for decades, and you may have heard that Vince McMahon's national expansion of the WWF was in full swing by 1985. So with McMahon outside the NWA agreements, and with Savoldi being a small enough fish that he could avoid the ire of Vince, ICW was in a good position to simply carve out their spot locally, and they would do so with the help of a more established promotion, Puerto Rico's WWC. The World Wrestling Council, under the ownership of Carlos Colon, had turned the island into a wrestling hotbed. When ICW first started, they recognized the WWC champions as their champions as well. This agreement also saw WWC stars like the Sheep Herders and Carlos Colon himself come into New England. ICW was even the site of Dory Funk Jr. winning the WWC Universal Championship in Bangor, Maine of all places. They were able to quickly expand throughout New England and beyond into New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. By 1986, however, the partnership dissolved and ICW crowned their own champions, with their first heavyweight champion recognized being Joe Savoldi. Oh, the promoter's kid, that makes sense. Around this time, they entered into new partnerships with Florida Championship Wrestling and the AWA. These brought in stars like Kevin Sullivan and Butcher Vachon, respectively, among others. Even Bruiser Brody swung through in these early days. While they brought in outlandish characters from other places, they also had plenty of their own. The roster was home to folks like the Tasmaniac, Super Duper Mario, yes, it's exactly what you think, the Cheetah Kid, Curly Moe, yes again, it's exactly what you think it is. All right, wrestling fans, it's time now for one of the hottest programs in professional wrestling, hosted by one of this great sport's biggest stars, Curly Moe. It's time for Curly's Classic Corner, as we take you back to yesteryear. Hi, this is Coily, Coily's Classic Corner. Yeah, that's right, and I'm coming into your living room. So you come with me, though, and we're going to go back to yesterday and watch some classic matches. And of course, there was the Boston bad boy, Tony Rumble. Tony Rumble was a wrestler turned manager who was a fixture on the Northeast independent scene at the time. He was a hell of a character, and it's a damn shame he never got a real shot with the WWF or WCW back in the day. My respect is dead, hey, but look at hey, like I said, a snot nose punk! A snot nose punk! I said you're a snot nose punk! Maybe you ought to do your talking Get out, kid! Hey! Honestly! Honestly, you want me next week? Hey! I'll smite you, you little punk! Get hey! Honestly! Hey, cut! Speaking of interesting characters, ICW also had a tag team managed by Rumble called The Undertakers. And they actually predated WWF's Undertaker by probably a year. According to former announcer Brian Webster, legend has it that Vince bought the rights to the name 
from the Savoldis. In 1990, Mario Savoldi took over control of ICW from his 76-year-old dad and also moved their home base to New Jersey. 1991 would bring major changes to ICW as Kevin Von Erich would join the promotion. Kevin would also bring along the world-class championship wrestling name, merging the two promotions into IWCCW, International World Class Championship Wrestling. After the Von Erichs sold Dallas to Jerry Jarrett in the USWA, Kevin retained the rights to the WCCW trademarks, selling that and some footage to ICW. Kevin at this point was famously unreliable, part of the reason why he left USWA, and this new partnership would be no different. He'd make a handful of appearances before disappearing and leaving IWCCW business to the Savoldis. The new IWCCW continued to spotlight established names like Kevin Von Erich, Ivan Putzky, and a really intense Tony Atlas. That's all I need to be happy. She spent a lot of lonely nights with me, and she brought a lot more pleasure to me than anybody I know. And if anybody else that, don't think you're going to take the bat away from me, do you crazy? Because I am the man, I am the champion, I am the ICW champion, and nobody, nobody, nobody going to get my belt. You hear me? Nobody. I don't let nobody get it. Nobody. But they weren't relying on the old guard. They also gave some shine to younger towns that would become mainstays of an extreme revolution. There was the aforementioned Tasmaniac, later known as Taz. The Cheetah Kid would become Rocco Rock and form the public enemy with Johnny Grunge, who was then known to IWCCW fans as Zip. There was the young little Guido when he was Damian Stone, Chris Candido, and a topless Tommy Dreamer. Paul Heyman himself even showed up for a short time. And there were even some young and hungry talents that didn't pass through ECW, like Scott Putsky and Vic Steamboat. Incredibly enough, these talents weren't just being exposed on local TV. In fact, they were featured on two national outlets. The Savoldi Show International Championship Wrestling aired on Sports Channel America, now Comcast Sportsnet, which at its peak operated nine networks with clearance in some of the nation's largest cities, including New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Philadelphia. They were also briefly featured on the Financial News Network, now CNBC, on Saturday mornings. The show also featured the legendary George Napolitano and Bill After conducting interviews and other segments. In June of 1991, they entered into a working agreement with the WWF. This relationship resulted in some of their stars like L.A. Gore and Mondo Clean getting opportunities with the Fed, and WWF stars Tito Santana, Coco Beware, and the Bushwhackers all appearing for Savoldi in return. Over the next several years, IWCCW's open-door policy would see it become a haven for stars waiting for the next call from the big time. Notable names like Greg Valentine, Nikolai Volkov, and Hacksaw Duggan all worked for the company until they got invites back to WWF or WCW. The most interesting case of guys waiting for the call was probably with the Honky Tonk Man and Rick Rude, who made several appearances in the spring of 91, hyping up a potential match to see who was the greatest Intercontinental Champion. The match never made it to TV, however they did wrestle, supposedly on an IWCCW house show in New York in June. Rude eventually went to WCW and the angle disappeared. To be fair though, they never advertised a match, just urged the audience to vote via a hotline poll. Full transparency, even people who worked for the company claimed the match never happened, so I don't know what to make of it. By 1994 though, things started to take a turn. They decided to revert back to ICW, the WCCW brand was long dead and wasn't helping them at all. But more importantly, the landscape of pro wrestling in the region had changed. In 1985, there weren't too many independent promotions, but the death of the territory system gave way to a major influx of promotions that took the audience away from ICW, including Tony Rumble's Century Wrestling Alliance. CWA, while being in existence since 1989, it really took off by the mid-90s and used many of the same talents that had previously been staples for the Savoldis. ICW would continue to chug along through the first half of 95, and even entered into a new partnership with IWA in Puerto Rico. Kind of full circle there. But it wasn't very helpful, and ICW wound up shutting down in August after a 10-year run. The TV show, however, would continue to air into 1996, featuring footage from the Savoldis' extensive library. 
Today, international world-class championship wrestling is remembered fondly as the promotion folks grew up on that wasn't WWF or WCW. Maybe it was something they found flipping through the channels and discovered there was a whole world outside of mainstream wrestling. Historically, it was one of the promotions, and probably the best one, to bring many of the players of ECW together for the first time. The Savoldis and IWCCW survived the territory days, influenced what the Northeast independent scene would become, and left a lasting impression on fans along the way. IWCCW clearly still has its fans. They're constantly being rediscovered and talked about online, so even though out of business, people are still enjoying them to this day. And that's pretty cool. Well, that's a wrap of my most requested promotion. Looks like I need a new most requested. So who else should I cover in this series? Let me know in the comments. I'm Scott from WrestleSpective. Thanks for watching.